And so, with those housekeeping details attended to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. Um, so with that, I am really thrilled to welcome our presenters today. Um, Chela Weber from OCLC will say a few words putting things in context, and then we'll hear from our, uh, our experts in the field, um, Rachel from NYU and Rosemary from Yale. Um, and I am going to queue up the slides and then turn things over to Chela to kick things off for us. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so um, I'll just briefly give you a little bit. Of, I'll just briefly give a little bit of context um, for today's webinar. Um, OCLC Research has a long history of working in archives and special collections, and we work in special collections because we really recognize that they're an important site of knowledge creation. Um, for research libraries and our researchers, and that they're made possible by the library's commitment to stewardship of their distinctive collections. Um, but unique, the unique uh, nature of the material in special collections can, can make scaling a challenge, and so we work to identify areas of common need and patterns of innovation and help libraries scale learning and expertise with these collections across the partnership. Um, in October of last year, we released the um, research and learning agenda for archive special and distinctive collections, um, which was created via participatory process uh, with members of the of the partnership and um, and colleagues outside the partnership, to really kind of try to articulate the shared challenges and opportunities that research libraries are facing, um, and suggest approaches for working on them together. Um, that publication and that work is really guiding our work right now. And, um, and so this year, we're presenting a number of webinars that respond to issues surfaced during um, our work on the agenda. Um, so accessioning was one of the issues that was highlighted. And these are a couple of pull quotes from the, um, from the agenda about accessioning. Um, so though it's really long been understood to be a core function of archival management, it's not a function that's gotten a lot of thought beyond the basic definition of gaining legal, physical, and intellectual control of our collections. Um, and as the profession has continued to grapple with our backlogs, I think, and understood the, the really systemic impact that backlogs have, um, we continue to kind of try to develop better ways to deal with them, right? And, uh, and comprehensive surveys and other work with the backlogs have, have helped us understand what kind of control and understanding we don't have of our collections, and therefore what kind of control we want moving forward. Um, and, and, it came, and it became clear in our conversations that accessioning um, is, the, is the first step, is the fundamental first step of the kind of control and understanding we want to have. And so it needs to be more of a considered part of our thinking and our theory and practice around um, access-centered and holistic collections management programs. Um, so because of that, uh, uh, today I've asked two speakers um, from RLP institutions uh, with programs that have made a, a real commitment to accessioning as an integral part of their holistic program on collections management. Both programs have at least one position dedicated entirely to accessioning um, and have for a number of years. Um, uh, the Beinecke has had an accessioning program for more than 10 years, and NYU has been developing their accessioning program for the last three and a half or four years. Um, and while not every program will be able to do this or has the number of staff to do this, I think that every program can benefit from their really deep experience and thinking um, in this area. So, uh, so with that, uh, we will uh, take it away. Let's see. Um, and Rosemary, I will pass the uh, presenter privileges to, to let's see. I think to we you? were going oh, to, to Rachel. To Rachel. Rachel. Okay. So okay. Take it away, Rachel. And I'm going to take you off mute. 
There you go. Uh, thanks, Marilee. Thanks, Jayla. Um, just a quick housekeeping note. Um, I have a document with uh, links that I'm going to refer to throughout this webinar. So it's bit.ly forward slash OCLC hyphen accessioning. So uh, anything I mention or show, don't worry about uh, writing down that uh, location. It'll be there and um, I'll keep it up afterwards so that people can access it. So um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Rachel Searcy and I'm the accessioning archivist at New York University Libraries. And um, I actually did maybe the same poll quote that Shayla did. <laughs> um, I'm really excited that OCLC Research uh, wanted to develop this webinar. Um, like Shayla mentioned, accessioning has been neglected in the profession for a while, both uh, from our theoretical understanding, but also just in day-to-day -day practice. Um, but in the past couple of years, I've noticed a significant interest in, increase in interest as people are having more conversations about the role accessioning plays in a larger framework, um, how accessioning fits into discussions we've been having for decades now about processing backlogs, collections control, and optimal access to collections, um, and how we contend with legacy practices at our institutions that gave accessioning short shrift, uh, but contributed to large-scale concrete problems that really limit our ability to be responsible stewards to our collections. So this is a really exciting time for us to reassess um, what I consider a really foundational archival function uh, and talk about what it looks like in practice. So. Um, our program at NYU is really a recurring loop of applied theory, daily practice, and reflection. And what I'm gonna do is walk through our accessioning framework with examples throughout to make things more concrete. And I'm gonna focus on this framework rather than go through each part of our workflow because every collection's a little bit different. Um, and I also imagine that you all have different kinds of collecting, different staffing models, resourcing and user groups, and I want this to be as useful to as many people as possible. So to start with a little bit of institutional context, about three and a half years ago, our library's management created a new department for centralized archival technical services for NYU's three special collections at our New York City campus. So as the newly hired accessioning archivist, my task was to create a consistent systematic accessioning program to serve these repositories. Um, I had the challenge of not only centralized practice, centralizing practices, which had differed not only between these repositories, but within, um, but also creating a formal accessioning program that we just didn't have before. So I spoke with a number of colleagues in different roles across the library to understand what had worked well in the past and the areas for improvement. Um, I analyzed our legacy accession records uh, for patterns and points of difference and reviewed what local documentation, if any, existed for accessioning. I also looked beyond NYU at manuals um, from other institutions and the professional literature to get a better sense of the current landscape and how we could apply it locally. Um, and at, at the risk of sounding terribly self-promoting, um, I just wrote an article um, published by the Journal of Archival Organization uh, called Beyond Control, Accessioning Practices for Extensible Archival Management, um, which I mention here um, because there are some aspects that I'm just gonna describe briefly, but go into far greater detail in that article. So uh, since this webinar is called Articulating Accessioning, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to define it. When I was reviewing manuals and scholarship related to accessioning, I found a real lack of clarity in terms of what access accessioning is, should be, and the reason we do it. Some definitions equate accessioning with the transfer and change of physical custody of the collection, whereas others imply you know, some kind of other work to record information about the collection at this stage. Um, but overall, it doesn't leave the archivist with a solid grounding to return to when making decisions in the wild. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think theory is important in a profession like ours, um, not as something isolated, but a resource for us to return to when we have to make judgment calls that may not have a clear right or wrong answer. And if we lack that theory and conceptual underpinning, we also lack that guiding star to help us make decisions thoughtfully and consistently. So in light of that ambiguity around accessioning, um, I developed my own definition. 
So for us, accessioning refers to the activities we carry out to examine, stabilize, and document information about archival materials upon our arrival, thus confirming our stewardship of the collections. So this definition is concrete about what we are doing and why we do it. Um, almost always, accessioning is described as the process of establishing three types of control over materials, physical, legal, and intellectual. Um, and this model is both a little ambiguous and restrictive um, and presents accessioning as a series of self-explanatory tasks, but it doesn't help us exercise professional, judge professional judgment when making practical decisions, um, especially when confronting new or complex issues. Um, there's been some great work to talk about accessioning as part of efficient or extensible archival frameworks, but I think we still have some work to do to more fully understand what accessioning is about and the role it plays. So this analysis informs a few decisions with our program at NYU. Uh, one thing that became apparent from this review was that this traditional view of accessioning and the three controls would be insufficient. And these distinctions are not merely semantic hair splitting, or at least I hope not, um, but rather that that traditional view doesn't fully encompass the activities we undertake or the goals we're trying to achieve. So to eliminate ambiguity in practice and make our expectations concrete, we need different terms and benchmarks for success. So in the course of accessioning archival materials, we work to establish a baseline of control upon their arrival so that we have an accurate understanding of our holdings and to ensure that materials are safe from needless damage or deterioration until they receive further attention. So to do this, we stabilize materials by identifying and addressing immediate preservation concerns, rehousing materials to prevent damage, separating and inventorying born digital materials and tracking locations at the box or object level. We establish administrative control by documenting the legal transfer of materials, terms of access, and intellectual property status of the collection in the descriptive record. We document our knowledge about the materials by recording the provenance, describing the formats present, the content of materials, and the context of their creation, all the while maintaining a clear record of intervention with the collection. And we facilitate access and future work by opening collections directly to users through the succession workflow when possible and creating baseline records that can be built upon with further arrangement and descriptive work. So before a collection even arrives in the archives, we look for potential pre-custodial opportunities uh, to collaborate with donors, record creators, curators, and conservators for the greater benefit of the collections. The more we know about the contents, context, and condition of the materials we bring in, the better we are able to describe them meaningfully, address or prevent preservation concerns, and potentially allocate the resources necessary to make them available to researchers. Um, in these interactions, we may be able to view the collection in its current environment, identify areas for appraisal, improve housing conditions, and leverage existing knowledge about the collection to form the basis of a descriptive record. And I wanna emphasize how collaborative this process is uh, with archivists, curators, and conservators bringing their expertise and perspectives to the table and working together for the benefit of our collections and ultimately our users. So we work to stabilize our collections upon their arrival and we use this term instead of physical control because physical control actually has a very, na very narrow definition, which is the function of tracking the storage of records to ensure that they can be located. Um, and we definitely want to do that, but we also need to do other things to ensure that the collections are safe from needless damage in our care. Um, to stabilize materials, we establish physical control uh, enact preventive conservation measures as appropriate and address the needs of born digital materials. So the photographs in these next two slides illustrate why physical control is not enough. Uh, the boxes on this slide are broken, uh, not safe to be picked up or moved, are too large to fit on our shelving, um, and in one of those photos, the collection isn't even in boxes, it's in garbage bags. 
So to stabilize these materials, we need to do more than simply document their location. Uh, they also need some rehousing. And it's not just about the boxes themselves. We need to think about what's inside. Uh, a box that is underfilled will result in slumping and damage to the materials over time. Materials with evidence of mold or pest damage uh, present urgent threats to our collection, and materials should be oriented as appropriate for their format. And we also deal with materials where the physical form is unimportant, or in the case of something like emails, never had a physical form at all. So we need to think about stabilization beyond just boxes toward thinking about how we make that information stable. So to do this, we inspect collections for mold, pests, and other contaminants. <coughs> Excuse me. And these must be addressed with our curators and conservators so that we don't contaminate um, the other collections in our space or retain materials that we don't want to keep. We house or rehouse materials as appropriate so that they are stable and don't become damaged in the time between accessioning and further work. So we replace broken boxes, boxes made of materials that could negatively impact the collections, or boxes that are inappropriate for their contents. Uh, and we ensure that those boxes are properly filled to prevent slumping. But we really limit um, actions like foldering or refoldering or removing uh, metal fasteners as we are looking to establish a baseline uh, rather than make everything pristine and perfect. And that takes time away from working on other collections. We uh, record the extent of the physical materials so that we understand how large a collection is. Um, we identify, physically separate, and inventory born digital materials so that we understand how much is there. Um, and if possible, create a disk image as part of accessioning. Um, and this is really where um, one of the places where that traditional accessioning framework feels especially static, as we must think about the actions and tools necessary to stabilize born digital materials. And then finally, uh, we record the material's location so that they can easily be tracked and retrieved, avoiding loss and displacement. So at the end of accessioning, an archivist should know how large a collection is and where each part of it is located. But when accessioning isn't done, an archivist may have trouble locating the collection um, or accidentally leave a few boxes out of their plan because they couldn't find them or didn't know they existed. They may be unable to accurately estimate how long processing will take, may need to do extra rehousing if the collection as it is cannot um, be moved safely, and may need to do um, extensive cleaning or rehousing if materials have been contaminated, adding significant time to their work. So, and if accessioning isn't done as a general practice, we won't understand how large our holdings are, how large our backlog is, how long it might take to address the backlog, where our collections are located, what kind of condition they're in, what kind of house, rehousing or conservation treatment might be required, um, and if we can move them to different locations without losing or misplacing them. So not accessioning or poor accessioning can really create some serious large-scale problems. So legal control is established as part of acquisition. And during accessioning, we work to communicate administrative control. Uh, we found that even when legal control had been established through something like a deed of gift, we still felt that we had a poor grasp on ensuring that access restrictions were being properly communicated and that both staff and users had accurate and helpful information about the copyright status of a collection. So administrative control ensures that the next person to need information about a collection can refer to its record in archive space rather than having to start from scratch with the collection file. And this helps us ensure the broadest possible access to our and use of our materials that's also commensurate with the promises we make our donors. So to do this, we analyze the deed of gift, contract, or terms of transfer, and then select an appropriate option from a series of set language options we have in our local archive space manual to populate the following fields in both um, an accession and a resource record. So those are um, the immediate source of acquisition, custodial history, conditions governing access, and conditions governing use. 
And if we don't do this, we risk providing access to materials that should be restricted, restricting access to materials that should be accessible, committing copy fraud, and not sharing important information about the authenticity of a collection. Uh, we then document what we know about this grouping of materials in accession and resource records in archive space, which is our system of record. And this ensures that information created or collected during accessioning is recorded in a reliable place that can be accessed by all appropriate users. Um, information about a collection's content, context, and path to the archives should be easily accessible and understood rather than living in one person's memory. Without this, we face significant obstacles performing arrangement and description, providing access to materials, responding to the departure of staff with deep institutional knowledge, and just more broadly understanding the needs of our collections uh, on the whole. Because further work on a collection might be months or even years after acquisition, the information gathered and created during accessioning uh, can provide a baseline level of access while also serving as a foundation for future work. So, um, if you look at a content standard like DAX, for example, and run down the list of requirements for a single level description, we typically know a lot of this information just from acquisition and accessioning, or we can at least get a start on it. Um, while we do get some unexpected collections that arrive on our doorstep, um, more often we are acquiring collections because we want them and know that they will be meaningful in the context of our collecting missions. So, with this perspective in mind, um, our accessioning workflows require creating um, an accession record and a resource record that complies with our local content standard. So for example, um, we can write a scope and contents note that summarizes the format, content, and context of the materials as we understand it at this point. Um, and it can always be revised or expanded upon later. Um, what we know at this point should be recorded as archival description uh, in line with local and professional best practices, even if that description is not made public in an access tool. So for the past three years, um, the majority of our accessions are actually accretions to existing collections. And when working with these materials, we uh, strive to document our understanding of them and also integrate them into the larger collection. So we update that resource record, the one that describes the collection as a whole, um, so that it represents the collection as it now exists. Um, and this typically involves updating things like dates and extents, and then also evaluating if any other descriptive notes should be updated. Um, but because of our historically variant collections management practices, many of our records don't meet our current um, professional standards or local guidelines. So when working with an accretion to one of these records, we update that resource record um, both to account for the new materials, but also to bring it in line with our current expectations. So um, we might correct agent or subject records or move information currently located um, in a collection level note to one at the series level. Um, and working with, an accre with accretion provides an opportunity to, re to return to existing descriptive records um, and improve their quality by evaluating them against current best practices and considering the collection in a different context um, than it may have originally been understood due to recent events, changes in scholarship, or active efforts to surface marginalized voices. So for example, um, we frequently change collection titles to adhere to DAX guidance, um, but also to acknowledge um, multiple records creators. Um, so most frequently that might be the names of wives who had contributed to a collection, but um, had been rendered largely invisible alongside their husbands in um, earlier description. So this is one of the many ways we can further operationalize um, an iterative approach to description and overall management. So in some instances, the level of control we establish during accessioning is sufficient for facilitating access and use. Uh, we open approximately one third of our accessions by count to users directly through accessioning um, by creating a finding aid and a catalog record. And then we provide maintenance for all of the records that we create. 
So particularly good candidates that can be opened through accessioning include small accessions, well organized accessions, accessions by, accompanied by usable inventories, um, or small accretions to processed collections. We also take into account preservation, access restrictions, donor expectations, and processing priorities. Uh, we want to be mindful uh, about what access to these collections looks like in the reading room and the impact that has on our public facing colleagues. Uh, we look for efficient methods to describe our collections and make them discoverable. So here you can see um, some of the different stages a collection might go through, starting with um, an inventory in Excel that can be ingested into archive space, maybe with the help of OpenRefine, which uh, can then produce an EAD encoded file or a MARC record, all from the same description. So here I have some examples of collections we've opened to users directly through accessioning. Um, and these are all listed in that links document if you want to take a look at them. So we have a collection level record that describes the collection as a unit. Um, a collection level record with a box level inventory, a small collection with an unarranged container list. Um, and this one's a bit unusual, but on occasion we can also open collections with hierarchy or complex container lists if we can reuse metadata, like a donor supplied inventory. Um, in many of these cases, it can be difficult to tell the difference between a record creating during accessioning and one created during you know, processing proper, since in both cases, the records comply with our local content standard and requirements for archival description. Um, typical giveaways um, are hierarchy and granular description, but even then, that's not always the case. Um, accessioning workflows are designed to be complementary to those in our arrangement and description program, uh, not replace them. Um, all accessioning entails archival description, and processing work may require some retrospective accessioning. Um, and our arrangement and description program reciprocally supports the accessioning program. Um, accretions to uh, collections that have been already processed are far more easily managed and likely to be made available to researchers rather than an accrual to an unprocessed collection that we uh, have substandard control over. So in the past three years, we've opened a little over 1,000 linear feet of materials to researchers directly through accessioning. And within the context of our department's work overall, uh, this represents about a quarter of the total amount we have opened to researchers through all of our activities. Um, but even when a baseline level of control is insufficient for discovery and access at this stage, uh, the work of accessioning provides us with a solid understanding of the current status of the materials and the amount of work required to make them available. Done systematically, we can look at this information uh, for just an individual collection or for holdings in aggregate. So this can help us reliably quantify the size of our um, backlog and the nature of it, um, prioritize collections for processing, and make other, um, sorry, I'm, I'm almost done, <laughs> and make other informed decisions about our collections. Um, so our accessioning program is a living one, and we are constantly looking for areas of improvement. Uh, we do some things differently than we did three years ago, and next year at this time, our program will likely uh, change again. Um, this year, we're looking to implement Airtable for workflow management, and we'll be codifying our practices for accessioning archived websites and born digital archival material. So um, ultimately, accessioning should assist in our every more to come. Um, and as we have these conversations about backlogs, collections control, and access to our collections, uh, both locally at our institutions um, and broadly in the profession, accessioning needs to be part of that discussion. Um, I've been thinking a lot about accessioning as a kind of archival infrastructure and how when it's done well, it's usually not flashy or fades in the background. Um, but when it isn't done well or at all, it can really wreak havoc on our collections and our ability to manage them. Um, and it requires a whole lot more work to fix. So um, I hope that this look at our approach to accessioning will be helpful to people. Um, and I'm also happy to answer any questions at the end. 
Um, and with that, I'll hand things over to Rosemary. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Rosemary, I'm going to take you off mute. There you go. Great. All right. Let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. All right. Morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the OCLC folks for inviting me to be a part of the webinar. Uh, my talk today is an adaptation of my presentation at SAA back in August. And while my awesome co-presenter, Rachel, has very wisely focused on the specifics of accessioning workflows, including a lot of helpful concrete details, I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit and talk about how my library historically and currently supports accessioning, um, but also about how complicated and important accessioning work can be in terms terms of emotional, temporal, and institutional investment. Um, so I am the accessioning archivist for the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. Uh, prior to my role with the Beinecke, I worked a series of project processing gigs at various institutions doing fairly traditional uh, non-MPLP arrangement and description of collections. Accessioning in general and at the Beinecke specifically is a totally different beast uh, from the type of archival work that I'd been doing before. Uh, it requires a unique and ever-shifting blend of emotional, physical, and intellectual labors that you know, hopefully produce an increased number of accessible collections at a quicker rate than more granular processing strategies. Uh, I would say that those of us doing accessioning work do so responsibly, uh, iteratively, and uh, fairly relentlessly. Um, just to give you an idea of kind of the, the scale here, uh, the Beinecke is voluminously well-staffed. Uh, we have around 120 souls in the library proper, 24 of whom work in the manuscript unit, uh, with five of us working solely on accessioning. Um, and yet, uh, you know, a hallway full of pallets stacked high with collection materials is, um, you know, much more the rule than the exception. Uh, to give you an idea of numbers, we typically acquire over a thousand linear feet of manuscript material each fiscal year. And since I joined the staff in 2016, uh, our accessioning team has accessioned over 1,200 acquisitions measuring at more than 2,100 linear feet. Um, and we've also performed baseline processing for over 2,000 linear uh, feet worth of collection material. On average, our five-person team processes about two to three times the linear footage of the rest of the manuscript unit, which is doing long longer form, often item level processing, and original cataloging. Uh, but I want to backtrack a little bit and give you an idea of how accessioning work has evolved at the Beinecke over the years. Um, and so, you know, in the beginning, there were curators. Uh, during the early days of the library, curators and their assistants were responsible for much of the paperwork and handling that went into new acquisitions. Given that there were few unified procedural workloads for tracking items and collections as they came into the library's possession, uh, there was not a lot of accountability and very little consistency in regards to the description of materials or even sometimes simply just knowing where things were at all times. Uh, it's also important to note that you know, in the early days of the library, the, the collections were focused very much more on collecting books as opposed to collecting uh, large-scale archival manuscript collections. Uh, in order to bring more control to the handling and tracking of materials, the Beinecke implemented a paper slip system starting, I think it was starting in the late 60s. So the Beinecke opened in October of 1963. So a few years after uh, they got on the ground, they started this paper slip system. Uh, the slips essentially followed collection material around, essentially documenting their journey. And two big things to keep in mind here, the information that was being collected and recorded was predominantly bibliographic in nature. And hence, many of those older acquisition records look very similar to, cat uh, to catalog records. And that made sense because at that point, archival accessioning work was being performed in the same realm as more traditional rare book cataloging. And there were fewer clear divisions between the types of description that were being generated for everything. The original incarnation of the paper slip system lasted until about the mid-80s, so a long time. Um, and around that time, the Beinecke's manuscript unit came into being as a separate entity from printed acquisitions. Uh, and they handle all of the books and printed material. Um, and both of those units are grouped together into a technical services division that still exists today. 
Uh, so at that point, after the manuscript unit was uh, founded and kind of established, uh, the Beinecke started using DB text to generate electronic slips and track the cataloging status of materials. And by the mid-90s, there was a growing focus on more comprehensive description of collections. So that included adapting existing inventories and dealers lists to bolster the records being created. Beinecke adapted DB text uh, to provide the functionality they needed until the early 2000s. Uh, so again, another, another very long stretch of time where we kind of had this homegrown system that was supporting the work that we did. Um, and at that point, Beinecke had also developed a database of uncatalogued collection material and a preliminary list started being entered directly into the system instead of just kind of uh, hard copy being uh, in a collection file. Um, and so the descriptive elements uh, that were attached to incoming accessions uh, became way more robust than just a simple accession number and its cataloging status. They actually started to document kind of the materiality and contents of, uh, of the materials themselves. Uh, now, during the last 15 years is when things have kind of really, really kicked into gear. The number of staff members uh, solely focusing on archival accessioning has gone from two staff members to five. And a uh, side note, in January, it'll become six. We're adding a three-year project archivist to our team whose sole focus will be uh, processing. Uh, so during these kind of early years of the 21st century, MPLP style processing guidelines uh, and procedures were introduced and baseline processing guidelines were developed and instituted. Um, and an instant, uh, here's where it gets really important, an institution-wide barcoding project in 2008 to 2009, along with a sub subsequent baseline processing project, uh, they took place. And those were essentially large-scale retrospective accessioning pro projects that brought much higher levels of control over all the collection material in the library's holdings. And everybody at the library participated in, in that work. Um, it wasn't just solely focused on the few, uh, the few members who were doing archival accession. It was, there was a buy-in from the library at large. Uh, and those projects essentially demonstrated an ongoing, extremely dedicated need for enriched form of accessioning protocols. Um, Archivist Toolkit was used to create records, track locations, uh, physical locations, and to generate finding aids from 2012 to 2015, um, and that's when we transitioned into using archive space. Uh, that now serves as both the staff and the public interface uh, for creating and browsing finding aids and accession records. Uh, Long-term yet concentrated shift from bibliographic description to DAX-compliant archival description, along with implementation of minimum levels of description required for incoming materials, has made accessioning much more than a simple in-the-door, what's-the-status tracking mechanism. The work our team does is a foundational element of our institution's acquisitions workflow, and it helps to ensure that a comprehensive amount of structured data is captured for all manuscript collection material. And I, you know, similar to what Rachel has done here, I just kind of want to show our required elements um, and our optional elements. And optional has huge air quotes around it, um, you know, because essentially almost all of these optional elements are usually standard practice. That's information that we collect as we go through. So when you look at pretty much any finding aid uh, either performed, uh, you know, either that came out of accessioning or that came out of the rest of the manuscript unit, it's going to have almost all of these elements. Let's see. So our accessioning team works to capture and record this information from all incoming manuscript items and collections. And at this point, I would just like to be really specific about the long list of stuff that we do as a team. So we'll start with assisting with or establishing shipping arrangements for incoming acquisitions, including in-person pickups and on-site packing. Uh, we create the initial accession record and archive space. We generate legal and payment paperwork, including deeds of gift and acknowledgments. We verify the contents of collections against existing inventories or non-existent inventories, um, going with dealers lists or you know, word of mouth or emails. Um, basically, we have to assess what we have and make sure we have what we're supposed to have. Uh, physically stabilizing materials, and that includes freezing and rehousing. Um, let's see, performing baseline 
arrangement and description, including a finding aid and archive space and a collection level catalog record um, that we use Voyager to create. Uh, this is a big tangle of responsibilities, but we manage them as best we can. And while all archival work contains elements of physical and intellectual and emotional labor, in my experience of working as an accessioning archivist, these three types of labor feel like they're intertwined much more intimately and more stressfully and with a complexity that feels remarkable in some way. I think it's important to acknowledge um, to acknowledge this uh, alongside the more nuts and bolts aspects of our work since it often feels like there can be a disjunct between the sometimes less acknowledged facets of the work that we do and the much more visible and kind of urgent expectations from our institutions about linear footage metrics and the concept of you know access uh, but it's more complex than that and and that should be more visible so I want to give you an example um, physically obtaining the materials is one of the very first steps in our workflow, and I'd just like to kind of break it down. So there are a lot of dynamics that go into arranging pickups with donors and sellers. Some situations are very straightforward, this many boxes, this address, this day, this time, but many pickups require more logistical gymnastics and a higher level of emotional sensitivity. Dealing directly with donors and dealers requires kindness, efficiency, and flexibility. And all of us here know that collection materials are rarely just boxes full of old things, but these boxes are actually full of lives lived, good and bad memories, accomplishments, personal connections. And it can be difficult to pin down a single spot on the calendar when asking someone to surrender the physical evidence of their own history or the history of someone they loved or you know, hated. Um, internally at Yale, we also have to work out details for pickups with our transportation department. We know that's an immense privilege uh, to have a transportation department. Uh, they provide us with drivers and moving vans, and we have to be very precise about where the truck is going, what kind of street they'll be parking on, if there are stairs, how many boxes, and so on. Sometimes we pick up dozens of boxes, or sometimes to pick up as a single item. That all happens. We have to be able to cover everything between one thing and, you know, hundreds of things in all different types of states. More often than not, though, we're just going to people's homes. We go into their apartments. We see where they live. We navigate their living rooms. We usually get into conversations about what they're giving to the library and why. We explain how we'll be taking care of their collections. We explain what processing means. We tell them that there will be a catalog record and that they'll be able to find it online. We talk about the library and how people use its collections. And I always try to answer questions. I'm very usually the person who shows up. I always ask if they have questions because sometimes they're quiet and they might not be as forthcoming about their anxieties or their excitements. I always try to say, is there anything that you need from me? Part of this work is being a resource for the donor to demonstrate that careful stewardship of their collection starts in the moment that I'm standing in their home or their garage or their storage unit. You know, part of this work is convincing them that even though I'm, you know, very sweaty and wearing jeans and loading a truck, uh, that I'll also be helping to make sure that the documentation of their lives and work will be cared for, will be visible to others, and will be understood. I ask for trust every time I show up at someone's door. Uh, you know, and of course, the other big part of this work on Pickup Day is actually just getting things packed up. Collections come to us on all forms. Some of them are beautifully labeled and inventoried, and the boxes actually have functional handles. It's wonderful and always surprising when it happens. Uh, more often, though, collections accrue over time. They're boxed up to save space. There's so many wine boxes involved in these pickups, um, you know, where they're packed in a hurry right before you show up, or they're not packed at all, and part of your job is trying to figure out how you can safely get everything from one point to the other. Um, and when I arrive at a location, in addition to being present and helpful to the person on site, I also have to just be actively assessing the physical status of everything that needs to be loaded up, making constant judgments about how to efficiently and safely move things. And we kind of have to be ready for anything and everything. And, you know, just keep in mind, again, I, you know, I want to come back to this slide for a second because, you know, 
Collection material pickups are just one of the first stops on the accessioning train. After getting materials to the library, members of our team then proceed to pay the bills, record the collection's physical presence to the library, ascertain what exactly is in all of those boxes, and make sure that we have what we're expected to have, decipher any existing inventories or documentation that came along with the collection, ensure that the material is physically stable and figure out if we have insects or mold to deal with, do we need to put everything in the deep freeze, do we need to bag everything, do we have to get it out of the building, what's going on? Uh, we have to shift other collections in our physical space to make room for temporary storage and active work with the new materials. We have to correspond with the donor to answer questions about when the materials will be available or why does the finding aid look so very different than the spreadsheet that was provided. Uh, we have to respond to researchers who need to use the collection before we've even taken it off the pallet and we have to work independently or as a team to perform the first iteration of physical and intellectual processing. And I mentioned different types of labor before because it's something that I really think about a lot especially since I started in the current position. Uh, you know, just seeing this list of different duties that make up my day-to-day -day work is clarifying. Reminding myself of the different types of energy that I and my colleagues expend in service of performing these duties feels important. And acknowledging the complexity that undergirds even the most seemingly mundane decisions is crucial to understanding how we can more consciously evolve towards practices that not only better serve patrons and donors and local communities, but are also ultimately better serving ourselves as archivists who want to grow and gain joy from the work that we do every day. Looking at this also reminds me of how much energy we direct outwardly beyond the walls of our archives as we interact over email and in person with people who are handing over their lives work, their partners' memories, the products they created, the records they kept. I feel like this list really helps give a clear view of the impact that thoughtful and comprehensive accessioning work can have for an institution when it's done well. Stats seem really dry, but this is the work behind the numbers. Robust accessioning procedures result not only in having a stronger day-to-day -day handle on the physical and intellectual status of everything you already have, but they also facilitate the development of richer pre-custodial work on collections headed in your direction. They speed the settlement of financial and legal transactions related to your acquisitions. And uh, they generally just foster an increased likelihood that you and your colleagues can react to emotional and logistical curveballs with grace and power instead of disarray. Acknowledging the humanity of our collections, our donors, our archivists, and our mission is all wrapped up in the way that we build relationships between every aspect and every individual involved in the acquisitions process. Effective accessioning work really is a true hybrid of archival workflows from so many different areas, administrative, legal, transportation, arrangement and description, donor relations, preservation, cataloging, and it takes time, institutional buy-in, lots and lots of documentation, an immense amount of empathy, and endless strategizing, but it's worth it. And when this work is supported by an organization, everyone benefits. I don't know if we lost Rosemary's nope, uh, I'm here. Oh, Sorry. audio there for a second. I was just curious. Um, yep, I'm here. All done. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. That was uh, so great. We have about 10 minutes um, for questions. And uh, I. so if you don't have your questions ready yet, put them into chat. Um, I have a couple of questions that were raised during Rachel's portion, portion of the um, presentation. And I am just scrolling to see. Uh, so, okay, so here's a question for you, Rachel. I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute so you can answer. Um, for serious conservation, so this is uh, was at the point where you were showing all of the scary <laughs> boxing um, and conservation uh, slides. I think everybody loves loves and loathes those photos um, because it's so familiar. Um, for serious conservation concerns like the mold, do you quarantine before or while reboxing? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I'll preface it by saying as much as possible, we really want to look at collections before we agree to take them to see if 
there is a situation like mold and then we can reassess. Um, but sometimes we do receive a collection, um, maybe sight unseen or you know, see something we didn't see at a site visit and it does have uh, the presence of mold damage or pests. Um, and in those cases, um, we have some protocols in place where we um, isolate the materials that are um, affected. Um, and then depending on what that contaminant is, uh, we have some different protocols. Um, but yeah, in general, we do try to isolate them and we have a separate room for that. Um, and then we'll reassess the situation with um, both our conservators and our curators because that might change um, whether they want to retain the material or not. Um, and then we don't want to go through any work of, you know, cleaning or rehousing if it's not something we want to keep. So um, I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you. Um, another question from your portion of the webinar. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, do you create the accession record and the resource record at the same time during accessioning? Um, yes. So um, during accessioning, we create an accession record in archive space that um, just describes that grouping of materials on its own. And then we also either create or edit the resource record so that it describes the uh, collection as a whole unit. So archive space has a functionality where you can, it's called spawning, where you can use your accession record to uh, automatically pre-populate um, some of the fields in that resource record. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question, at our institution, we have to provide internal monetary value. Um, do you have any comments or suggestions on good practice? Is this something that you, either of you do at your institutions? Um, at NYU, this is not something that we do, at least in terms of um, like keeping in the sort of archival collections management system. Um, it might be something that the curators do, but I actually don't know about that. Rosemary, do you have any? Yeah, not, that, not that I know of. Um, I, I don't think that's something that we've, that we do here. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll jump in uh, and say I, I previous, Chayla and I previously worked with Rachel at NYU, and sometimes we needed to do that for our development department um, uh, so that because they reported numbers out it, internally. Um, I wouldn't ever do that for an external, um, uh, I would never give valuations to it, someone externally. Um, I think that's a conflict of interest, uh, pretty well understood conflict of interest, but we did have just a, a per box value um, that we just gave to everything, which was really kind of a, honestly, just kind of a shot in the dark. I think we undervalued some collections and overvalued others, but I, um, I, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was like $100 a box or something, um, or maybe that's actually not the number it was, but that was the easiest way to do it without spending too much time and energy trying to um, come up with valuations that, that you know, weren't were only for internal reporting purposes. Right, on a per box or per collection level. Yeah, um, yeah. That sounds uh, sensible. Um, so here's a question for Rosemary. Uh, you mentioned the spreadsheet that's provided by um, donors. Is it your standard practice to ask donors to provide a brief listing and do you ask them to mark or number the boxes? Uh, yeah, we actually absolutely do both of those things. Uh, we're in the process of developing guidelines both for donors and dealers um, as well as just like an actual packing, how to pack your collections document uh, that we can give to people because uh, part of the thing that we do, you know, we do click collection pickups so that they're in a certain geographic region. Um, but we also arrange shipping logistics through, uh, you know, a couple of contractors. But sometimes I'm also calling FedEx offices and saying, I, you know, here's my credit card number. Will you please print up shipping labels for this person? They're bringing in a box. So um, we are trying to develop kind of like a standard baseline amount of information that we request up front from dealers and donors so that we have an idea of what's in the boxes. Um, it speeds verification so we can find particular items, um, you know, to ensure that we have what we're supposed to have. Um, but it also gives us 
information to repurpose for the finding aid. Um, it allows us to delegate the work of processing a little bit more efficiently, uh, both you know within the team, but also to our student workers if we have them. Um, and we absolutely ask them to uh, number the boxes if possible uh, and have that line up with the inventory that they provide us so we can cross-check things more quickly. Um, it's, you know, a spotty response. It depends on, you know, who you're getting stuff from. Um, but usually people are more than happy to give that kind of information. It gives them a little bit of buy-in uh, to kind of the acquisition process beyond just handing off their materials. Um, it gives them a, a chance to evaluate what they're giving. Um, and it usually ends up getting us either a list and or a little bit more contextual information about what they're giving us which allows us to do you know better scope notes so great um, so here's a question for both of you uh, where does the accessioning unit sit in relation to the curatorial and processing units and um, and if it exists a collection management unit this would probably be easier if we had a whiteboard or something yeah, I mean, I can for the binary key accessioning is one of the two uh, sections of technical services, which is essentially our collection management department. So uh, technical services is broken into manuscript unit and uh, printed acquisition. So printed acquisitions deals with all of the books, um, and we deal with everybody's papers. And then accessioning. Within our side of the manuscript unit, it's accessioning the five of us, and we work alongside uh, processors, and there's uh, over 20 of them, and so they do the more long form um, and detailed processing work. Um, but then we have, uh, we liaison with the curatorial group uh, and the administrative group um, all, all the time. So we're just, you know, we're one small ring of the circus, but it's a, you know, a wheel within a side. And, you know, inside a wheel, inside a wheel. So, um, and then for us at NYU, um, accessioning happens within a department called Archival Collections Management, um, which also includes the processing uh, for the archival materials, and that reports into a larger unit called uh, Knowledge Access Research Ma Resource Management Services, which uh, handles acquisitions, serials, and e-resource. E uh, management, uh, cataloging, and discovery systems. So um, the curators report into the special collections, which is a different, um, a different department entirely, but we work really closely with them. Um, Marilyn, do you want to do one more? Do we have time for a couple I'm more questions? I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> and reading off my question, um, so we have about time for one more question. Um, uh, this is uh, for Rosemary. Um, Audra expresses appreciation for the impact slide. I also have great appreciation for that slide. And wondering if you have ever used this to provide data to resource allocators, administrators, donors on the operational impact of accessioning work. Um, I think I'm in a pretty fortunate situation that the uh, that the administrators are are fairly already since I've been here supportive of the work that we do. Um, I know that I use this slide at at FAA, and I actually heard back from several. Uh, curators and and the the head of the library talking about how it was good for them to see how it was kind of parceled out in that way, um, kind of in that granular way. So um, I think it definitely has an impact for people to both see how complex this work is, but just also the type of energy it takes from the workforce, from the people who are doing it. Um, so I think it's I think it's a really good method of kind of communicating the the depth of the work that we do. So I'm I'm happy it's you know, actually made sense to people and kind of helped them understand what we do a little bit better. Okay, uh, great. So we are unfortunately out of time, um, but I want to thank uh, our presenters for doing such a great job today. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and you will be receiving, um, as soon as this is posted to our website, you'll get an email from me um, uh, with links to that um, event page uh, when it's updated 
and um, we hope that you will definitely register for uh, other webinars that we have in, upcoming in this series. We'll send a link to all of those as well. Encourage your colleagues to come along with you. It's always uh, Learning is always more fun together, uh, we find. So thank you so much um, to our presenters, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.